Thank you all for joining us. I'm Kristen Muller and I'm the director of Peters Valley School of Craft and there are people obviously from all over the country and all over the world um, and we're so excited to have you join us. Um, we're so sorry that we can't be together in person but this technology is pretty amazing by um, just being able to log on and come together to see and hear um, Daryl. Um, this is uh, the first of our virtual artist lectures. For those of you who don't know what we do, Peters Valley School of Craft is in Layton, New Jersey. Um, we're celebrating our 50th year in during the COVID pandemic, which makes our programs not be able to run in person. We have immersive workshops. Um, and each year during the spring, summer, and fall months, people come from all over to learn um, how to make things together and we have visiting artists and uh, we're right on the Delaware River and the Delaware River runs between and in this part of the country runs between Pennsylvania and New Jersey so our neighbors in Pennsylvania uh, from the Greater Pike County Community Foundation have uh, funded this wonderful lecture series that typically happens in the Pike County Library but obviously we can't do that right now. Um, and we're so grateful that um, the Greater Pike County Community Foundation and the Pike County Library uh, agreed to partner with us and let us do this virtually. So we're tuning in with multiple audiences and we're so grateful for the funding that allows us to bring the Richard L. Snyder Fund and the Greater Pike County Community Foundation for funding this program. It's just really fabulous. Um, so today we're with me, with um, Daryl's lecture, we're, go we're going to mute everyone as we've done and the videos. We're going to let her speak. It's going to be a more formal presentation. Um, you can reach her at her website if you'd like to connect with her afterwards. Um, and we're going to um, keep the audio and the video off. Um, you, you can uh, chat. On, on it. If for those of you who aren't familiar with Zoom, at the bottom of the uh, page, you can navigate and, and hit the chat box and then you'll see everybody's comments. But Daryl's not going to be responding to that because she's going to be talking to us and focused on her telling us her story. Um, so welcome everyone from all over, places near and far. Um, it is my great pleasure to introduce Daryl Lancaster, who's a fiber artist, and I've known her for the 11 years I've been at Peters Valley and her late husband. They have been incredible supporters of Peters Valley as board members and teachers and students and supporters, and even delivering us her daughter last year as our um, fiber studio assistant. So we have a deep relationship there and it's really wonderful. Um, Daryl's a hand weaver and fiber artist known for her hand woven garments and has been sewing for more than 50 years. It's hard to believe you look too good for that. Um, Daryl gives lectures and workshops to guilds, conferences, and craft centers all over the United States. It's actually hard to pin her down. We're really lucky that she's homebound right now and we can um, work with her. Um, she's the former features editor for Handwoven magazine. She frequently contributes to various weaving and sewing publications and contributes regularly to Threads magazine. Daryl has a long and rich history with Peters Valley's fiber department and we're just so glad to have you here tonight and um, thank you everyone. Let's get on with the show. It's going to be fantastic. Take it away, Daryl. <laughs> Thank you. I need to check. Can you see my screen? Can you see the picture with the mom and the three girls? And can you hear me okay? Yes, we can see you and we can hear you. Yay. All right. So a huge thank you to Peters Valley for this opportunity to be able to share my story with you. It's, a, it's an entertaining one, and at least to me. And I, um, I just wanted to say that my relationship with Peters Valley started in 1974 in a college 
class called Field Trips in Textiles. Mostly we would meet in Manhattan, um, go to galleries that had fiber shows. But one week we drove out to this place in rural Sussex County, New Jersey. And it was the beginnings of this place called Peters Valley. And I stepped through that doorway of the weaving studio and I was in love. And that began a relationship that is still going strong to this day. Anyway, I will begin my story by telling you that about 20 years ago, I woke up from surgery. I had had a biopsy and the surgeon was waiting for me to wake up. And she said to me, I'm sorry. She said, it's cancer. And those are words you never wanna hear. I didn't see it coming. But I will tell you the first thing that popped into my head, I'm not kidding you, was a quote that I had heard um, many, many years ago on NPR. I don't know who said it, but it has stuck with me and defined the way I look at life. And that quote is, nothing bad ever happens to an artist. It's all fuel for their work. And that got me through my cancer experience. It got me through many other devastating things that happened in my life. And I look at life now as an artist, because whatever happens to you, it's part of your story. So I'm gonna start at the beginning because, it, and it's important for me to start there because I wouldn't be who I am and where I am without help, the help I received along the way. And it started with my mom, who was the quintessential housekeeper, 1950s homemaker. She sewed like a dream. She made all of our clothes. She made the curtains, the, dra the, the upholstery, the slip covers. She cooked. She was the hostess with the mostess. And I love this picture because this kind of sum summarizes my childhood. It was a mom and three daughters. She tailored her suit. It was a Moigashell linen uh, with an Easter bonnet and that my dad would give her every year for Easter. There was a line item in the budget, and here were the three of us all dressed alike. And what I love most about this picture, as the oldest, is that I got to wear the full bunny on my dress. So in 1965, my mom decided that it was time that her two older children learned to sew. She took us to J.C. Penney Fabric Store, and I walked in there, and my but my brain exploded. There were so many possibilities. I could pick a pattern and I could pick fabric and I could make my vision. It was probably my earliest and best memory and I never looked back. Um, it, over the years, uh, this photo on the left uh, surfaced and it was of my first outfit and my sister's first outfit, the ones we made that first sewing lesson. And I picked bright floral culottes, were very big then. And my overachieving younger sister picked a plaid. If you're a garment maker, you know the irony of that. So, and so as far as irony goes, the, the, <laughs> the funny part of all this story was as much as my fashion uh, vision just, just exploded, I went to parochial school for eight years. And so for eight years, I wore a uniform. Um, six of those last eight were at a school that had a red and gray plaid uniform. To this day, as an artist, I still have an aversion to putting that combination together. It's very lovely, but I wore it for six years. It's enough. Um, so when I went to public high school, I was able to, um, I went to a public high school that had an art department. It had art classes, it had painting and drawing, it had crafts, it had a potter's wheel, it had um, copper enameling, and of course, the fiber technique du jour in the 1970s was macrame. I latched onto it because macrame was a fiber technique, and I was so well versed in fiber at that point, I already had a dressmaking business in town doing alterations. So even though macrame at that point was really about plant hangers and bathroom curtains and wall hangings, 
I managed to turn it into garments. I was able to take those square knots and I was able to mold into a whole sort of breastplate shield with copper enameling that I had done in, in a different part of that art program. And it, it basically awoke me to the possibilities of creativity. So when it was time to go to college, um, my dad was very progressive. He wanted his three daughters to go to college. I wanted to go as far away as I could, doesn't every 18 year old. Um, but if you know the geography of New Jersey, you will know that New Jersey is only three hours top to bottom. So growing up in Southern New Jersey, the furthest I could go that had an art department was Montclair State. It was as far as I could go from home which was two hours. And I, I went there and I, I was basically told to get a degree and what it was in was fine with my dad, but he did encourage me to go into business. And I said, oh, dad, I don't want to go into business. But the underlying thing that I was encouraged to do was find a husband because in my parents' eyes, that was how you made it in the world. It was through that husband connection. That was the early seventies. And, um, I went to school and in my second semester of my freshman year, I discovered the fiber department. They had looms, they had spinning wheels, they had yarn. And it was, again, a language that I already spoke. Um, I know some of you are potters, especially Kristen is a potter and I did study pottery and I was pretty good at wheel throwing. But I will tell you, I never liked pottery in that once you closed that kiln door, you lost control. And, and that was part of my inexperience. And when you have your own kilns and you know what you're doing, obviously you have better control. But in fiber, you always have control. If no matter what happens, if I make a mistake, if I don't like it, I can take the scissors and rip it out and redo it. And I loved that about fiber. I still love that about fiber. It is my, uh, my medium of my soul. So in college, uh, I was trained more academically in um, concept, a conceptual artist is sort of the term for it. And as a conceptual artist, you are trained to look at the world in a certain way, um, not in an obvious way. And you're taught to look beyond the obvious and produce a reflection of that through your hands. Um, I didn't understand that until many years away from college and I and I found that the lack of technical information frustrating but in academia I think that the I didn't appreciate till I was I was well away from school is that the technique comes later by practice but learning how to think and learning how to look at the world and learning how to interpret the world and know that there's many opinions and ways to do things was really critical to building who I am as a craftsman. So uh, my senior year of college, I did a, an externship and actually it was paid, I got minimum wage, to sit with a very large Cranbrook floor loom um, at the headquarters for Einstein Moonji, the carpet department store. Those of you from northern New Jersey may remember this chain. Um, their main store was in Paramus. And I had a loom there. And on Wednesday nights and all day Saturday, I would demonstrate weaving tapestries and rugs. And it was really fun for the clients. I made five tapestries during that year. The first four, uh, the three on top and the one on the lower left, all sold while I, um, you know, at some point. Um, but the last one in the lower corner hung in the vice president's office. Many years later, I actually went and visited Einstein Moonji and I asked if I could purchase that tapestry back because I knew that I would never do another tapestry again. And it was not what I wanted to do with weaving. I make clothing. And I knew that if I had that tapestry in my possession, I could always show it as an example, but I was going to be a clothing maker. So my last uh, semester of fiber in college, I actually made clothing. And um, what was available yarn at that time and the kinds of silhouettes that one thought of as handwoven clothing was pretty typically uh, the bog jacket. So this is a 
facsimile of a bog jacket. Um, and for those of you who don't know what a bog jacket is, it is a silhouette that was found made mostly of rectangles in a bog in the Bronze Age. So yeah, it, it was, you know, could have been made from skins, but in cloth that was woven in rectangles and put together. So this is my version of the bog jacket, and I will tell you it was trashed. It did not go over well. This is a conceptual art program, and I made function. I made something that functioned. So I was trashed for it, but determined because the loom is just a way to get cloth, and I know what to do with cloth. So I did fortunately find a husband. My dad was happy. And um, this was one of the greatest connections of my life because the, the guy that I found met at a party at college, he was already gainfully employed. He just happened to go to this party. Um, he had a mother who turned out to be a master bobbin lace maker and an incredible spinner. That's a, for those of you who are not a fiber, fiber people, that would be spinning yarn on a spinning wheel, making your own yarn. And that connection lasted, you know, for most of my adult life. She was my friend. She was my other fiber mentor. Um, and, uh, and in 1978, I actually married her son. And she, my mother made the wedding gown. And she made 12 yards of bobbin lace to trim all the ruffle on my wedding gown and the bobbin lace handkerchief. And it, it, those two women were really the backbone of, of who I am now. So when I got out of college, it was really important for me to earn my living, and I had acquired a loom because one of my grandmothers had died, and I got $1,000, and I bought my first loom, which I still have. It's in the studio behind me. It's still my first love, and I answered an ad looking for a production weaver. I had no idea what a production weaver was, but I had a loom because I had a loom, and so therefore, I... Um, thought I could do anything because you're in your 20s. Of course you can do anything. I had no idea what I was doing, but the tenacity with which I approach life, kind of sometimes I look back and it kind of scares me because I jumped into everything at first and I had no idea what I was doing, but I made it work. There was no internet to look at. There was no fellow weavers to bounce things off of. You just figured it out. And so I was able to make uh, a lot of yardage for these couple of women who made a business out of making hand-woven mohair yardage and taking it into Manhattan and selling it to designers. And I was one of their chief production um, weavers. And we, I also made some clothing for them. And it was really my start into learning how to weave quickly, fast, and accurately. So all the time I'm doing that, I'm thinking about how I can make a living selling hand-woven anything. And craft fairs were really coming into their own. They were um, the, the Rhinebeck Craft Fair, which would sort of been near where I lived, um, was, was a really big thing. My husband and I would go and we'd visit and we'd see what other people were making. And the problem with clothing for me was that I knew too much. I was a tailor. The kinds of yarn that was available and the kinds of clothing I would want to do, I couldn't connect the two. So in the beginning, I started doing household textiles. I made placemats. I made uh, throws, um, alpaca throws in all different colorways to match people's living rooms. I made um, shawls and scarves because all weavers do that. I had learned a technique, um, a loom-controlled lace technique, so they were open and airy. And the lower right-hand corner of that picture is uh, one of the lean shawls I did but uh, and I made more complicated ones with mixed uh, yarns and someone and I don't know to this day who it was whether it was a family member or a friend said to me Daryl why don't you cut a hole in the neck put a belt around it and make clothing out of it and again one of these light bulbs exploded in my head and I thought oh my god that's that's I need to do that because I'm home that's what I do best and so the beginning of my production work was all about taking these lino scarves and shawls and turning them into garments um, my one of my first craft booths I loved outdoor shows because we could take the dog with us the puppy you could sit under the shelves that held the placemats and I borrowed a tapestry back from Einstein Moonji so that I could 
show it uh, in my craft booths how what a versatile weaver I was. There's an early picture of me weaving on my first and my first loom. Um, again, that's behind me in the studio. And then the production work evolved. You know, I have, uh, as you can see over the years, um, it changed. It was really became all about clothing. I could fit anybody. I could take an order and then be able to um, make it up and ship it to them. So I began to play around with 30 yard warps, which is how much I would put on the loom at a time and then have multiple wefts. So there were things that were companions, you know, you could have on one warp, like the upper left hand corner, the red and diagonal sliced black, that was one warp with two different wefts that I was able to then combine in a garment. So as I got more sophisticated towards um, the end of the 80s, uh, I got more into coats. You could have a lining, a thermal interlining. There were pockets. Um, they, and, I, and I began to really play with silhouettes that worked for people. Um, I think this is my, the, I think the top two photos are my craft booth at the Baltimore Craft Market, which was 1986. And uh, I'm not sure where the ones in the lower corners were from, but they were also in my archives. So I threw them in because you can see that I had a lot of clothing and I, and I did clothing well at the time. So in 1989, I suffered from what every, we, what every craftsman um, dreads, and that was burnout. I would produce 30 yards of fabric in a sitting. I would cut it out. I would sew it. I had my sister who was going through architectural school. I'd ship her cut out garments and she would sew them because you really couldn't tell the difference in our sewing. We were trained by the same person. So she worked her way through architectural school sewing garments for me. And I would do craft fairs on the weekend. And I loved it and I loved it until I didn't love it anymore. It was grueling. Um, I, I didn't know where I was gonna go with my life. But I began to be asked to teach at guilds. Um, they would ask me to come in first to talk about marketing. And then, then they would ask me to come in and talk about how I turned my handwoven cloth into a garment. And what I found really quickly was that I loved empowering people to make it themselves. You know, it was one thing for me to make a garment for somebody. Um, and they could pay me. And that was that. That was that. But to watch somebody make something that cloth came from their loom and that garment came from their hands and they learned how to fit themselves was magical. And in 1989, although my husband and I were told we couldn't have kids, we um, found that I was pregnant and I was in my mid-30s at this point. It kind of took both of us by surprise and kind of upended where we thought we were going with our lives. We didn't see it coming, and so now I was pregnant. And three years later, I had a second child. By now, I'm nearing 40 years old, and I am, um, and I will tell you those were tough years creatively. I didn't have two children that would just sit happily and play under my loom. I had holy terrors. They were both hyperactive. Um, if I turned my back, my daughter would scramble up on the dining room table and rip the chandelier right out of the ceiling. So it made weaving really, really tough. But in case any of you who have tuned in um, are from my local town, you will laugh because in those days, I was the most hated mother in Lincoln Park because um, every year our town had a Halloween parade and a Halloween costume contest. And my kids always won first place because I'd show up with this kind of stuff. And um, oh, I, oh, the letters that got written to the town, this is not fair, the kids should make their own costumes, whatever. You know, it's the one gift I could give my children. And they loved it. And I have this picture and um, I, I had fun with these costumes. So because it was really tough for me to weave, but because I had done craft fairs for 10 years and I had saved every piece of scrap that I had cut from my years of production weaving in organized bankers boxes in the attic, I was able to go to my sewing machine and still create clothing, but piecing together the leftover scraps from all those years of production work. And this actually kept me um, 
this kept me focused on something other than the kids and it gave me an opportunity when they were at school or when they were um when they were uh napping oh they never napped so forget that uh when when i was able to find five minutes to myself i didn't have to worry about threading a loom or, or acquiring yarn i already had this raw material and i had a sewing machine and i could do this so these were pieces i have a whole body of work that was created out of leftover scraps and in 2000 i began to expand the teaching a little as the kids got old enough to leave them with my husband or to leave them with friends or to leave them period I began to teach a little further afield, and in 2000, I was accepted to teach at Convergence in Cincinnati. Um, it's the furthest I had ever traveled to teach, and I was scared. This was the big time. I'd been teaching for already 12 years or something in the Northeast. Everybody there knew me, but nobody past the Northeast knew me. And I had done a seminar in um, critiquing the garments technically that were in the fashion show and they hung in a gallery and i still hear people today remember back to that lecture because it's where i said to other weavers no it's not right it's not because it's hand woven it's because the pattern is wrong and this was kind of a new concept to people who were still coming out of the bog jacket era and I remember that night at a performance of Nick Cave, who is a Chicago performance artist, who, sidebar, did a workshop at Peters Valley a few years before that, that I took, that was probably one of the greatest workshops I ever took in my creative life. So thank you, Peters Valley, for that. But Nick Cave did a performance that night, and in front of me, I didn't know, was the editor for Handwoven Magazine. And she turned around and said to me, after the performance i had somebody in your lecture and uh we love what you said and we would like you to write for handwoven magazine mic drop so um you know being at the right place at the right time um having the right person influence you know where i was going with this i had no idea if i could write i never did this before but i went to catholic school i could diagram a sentence i knew how to put thoughts on a paper so I ended up, um, my first article for them was about this piecing technique. And it turned out fabulous because I was able to begin my career writing and I have never looked back. Uh, within a short time, I was asked to be their features editor. I was asked to write the color and forecast column, which was really important um, because I love this column because I was able to research a palette and then look for an image that reflected the theme of that palette, create cloth to go with that image and the palette, and then create something from it. So I did, I wrote for Handwoven Magazine for 35 issues straight. I wrote features, I wrote the forecast column, I had a stable of weavers that I would hand them a palette and I would say, here's what I want, this is the image I want, run with it. Um, for all of us who worked on that column, it was a great opportunity. And it, the column basically ended because the magazine was sold and they realized how expensive it was to produce. But it was a great opportunity for me. Meanwhile, I am now at this point in my life um, in my mid 40s and people around me are starting to have major life events. You know, um, they're aging, they're not happy with the way they look. Um, I've friends got divorced, friends were diagnosed with cancer. It was really challenging to watch this and know that the medium that I chose to create in didn't leave me the opportunity to have a voice in my work. And so I embarked on a series of pieces that, yes, they were clothing and they were engineered with clothing in mind, but they weren't ever really meant to be worn. They were art pieces which put me in a quandary because in the art community, I make clothing. And in the clothing community, this was kind of like, why would you put that on the back? And you can't wear that really nice vest. So this was a piece that I did about body image. Um, and the text reads, uh, in case you can't see it on your screen, after varsity cheerleading, Deanne went on to marry her high school football hero and become Miss April 1976. It was the highlight of her life. 
and by 30 she was divorced and by 40 she was dead from breast cancer so this piece is called in memoriam but one of the things that i most love about garments and i alluded to this early on in my talk was that the front and the back can never be viewed really at the same time and there is an inside to the garment there is this secret inside that only the wearer knows and so inside this garment, I put all kinds of images that were important to me. Um, the top image on the inside of this is my kindergarten picture, because that year my daughter was graduating from kindergarten. And I wanted to know how all of this would turn out in her life, what, what body image she would be, would be um, up against, you know, what kinds of things society would require from her. And I did this next piece because um, a couple of friends were getting divorced. And you know, when you have lifelong friends, husband and wife, and they split up, you're kind of forced to choose sides. And you see things you really wished you didn't see. And you know, the victim is about who, you know, who is really the victim here. And kind of we're all victims when we share lives together. Um, Unfortunately, the year I did this was the first year that Spider-Man was released, and I did not have that in mind when I was making this. This was a piecing technique, and it was about the victim being caught in a web. And when Spider, the, the, so the first place I exhibited this, everyone came up to me and go, oh, well, how clever of you thinking of Spider-Man. And I was like, oh. So I had to retire this piece pretty quickly. And um, unfortunately, because it was misread, and there was nothing I could do about that. Um, in 2001, my dad died suddenly, and it was a tough time, as anyone losing a father. Um, and when you, and when someone's life is over, and you have to go through the detritus of someone's life, you look at just, just piles and piles of stuff. Um, my father was a, quite an avid photographer, and he took pictures of everything. He recorded all of our childhood. But the interesting thing about my dad was he took the photos, but he was never in the photos. So there was this amazing story of my childhood. So I made this vest, this walking vest that was very, it was white mohair, brushed mohair, and it was very cloudy and, you know, sort of, a, you know, a cloud of memories. But inside was my childhood. And I love that metaphor. So in 2002, I was diagnosed with cancer. This is when I woke up and I said to my surgeon after she told me I had cancer, I had breast cancer, and I said to her that um, nothing bad ever happens to an artist. It's all fuel for their work. And, and I remember coming back from chemo one day and walking into my studio and the stash that I had acquired at that point and looking at all of that and handling all the yarn and the cloth and saying, what happens if I die and never get a chance to use this? And it really struck me is that we acquire and we acquire and we acquire, especially as craftsmen, and we hope we live long enough to really make all of that into something that has our voice in it. So the other great thing about uh, that cancer gift that it gave me was no fear, because what's the worst that can happen? You get cancer and die, you know, and so walking into my studio and being afraid to make a piece that it might not be a showstopper, it might not be an award winter, it became critical for me to just make stuff. I needed to get through that stash so that I could, I, I could like touch it before I died. And so I made this vest, this, this walking vest. Um, the fabric on the inside, the lion's head, was something I had silk screened in college. It wasn't very well done, but it, it jumped off the shelf at me and said, use me. And um, I love this vest. Um, it is still one of the most talked about and beloved pieces that I carry around with me. It was done almost 20 years ago. But I wrote a features a feature article for Handwoven Magazine called Designing from the Stash. And to this day, it, I'm still told it is everyone's favorite. So if you do have a handwoven collection, it's um, the September, October 2002 issue. It is, um, it was giving people permission to work only from their stash, to acquire a stash and use it. 
to look at what you have and what can you create from it. And it has been sort of a game that I play with myself from that point on. What's the worst that can happen? It doesn't work. It's cloth. Cut it up and make something else out of it. Um, so in 2005, I was asked to give the keynote at um, a conference in Sheboygan, Wisconsin. And I flew up there. Um, and not only was I giving the keynote address, but I was asked to judge the fashion show. And they thought it would be a brilliant idea if my work ended the fashion show. And I thought, oh, dear God. Um, and so I dug through my still vast collection of scraps at that point, And I came up with these two pieces that would end a fashion show where I was the judge and then gave a keynote address. And they were all out of scraps that were in my attic from years of production work. And so, um, you know, so I was able to create these couple of pieces on the fly. And I I have never looked back. In 2006, my beloved mother-in-law died. And I was there when she died. I, she was in a nursing home. I sat beside her. I held her hand. And as you know, there is something, there, there is something um, amazing about watching someone's soul leave and fly to a better place. And I remember the grace with which she passed. And I picked up a hospital napkin and I wanted to remember that peace and that grace on her face. And as she was taking her last breaths, I did a quick sketch. And I carried that napkin around with me until it started to disintegrate. And I thought, let me scan it and at least preserve it. And then I latched onto a technique that I had used before. And it was about taking an image and putting it on fabric. You can try, now the technology allowed you to do that. In this case, it was silk habitat and cutting it apart and then putting it back together again in a way that was very metaphoric in how you weave something back together that creates a whole when you're done. And so I, so I set out to create um, this image of her, and um, I did it on cloth, and I wove it back together again, row by row, and it was a very healing way for me to deal with. I, I was able to clean out her apartment, and for three years, all of her belongings were in my garage, and I'd go through a box at a time, and of course, like my dad's detritus from his life, there were a lot of photos. And so I did this diptych of her when she was in her 20s and one when she was 90. She died at 99. And, um, but I had these two pictures that showed the same face. And I loved it. And I was able to, again, recreate her in a way that I wanted to remember. I also found in my dad's collection this wonderful picture teaching my sister to read. Um, I love this photo. I did this. It's a pretty large piece, 16 by 16, and my sister has it. Um, it was important for me that she get this because it was my gift to her. I mean, she's been such an important part of my life. I'd done a series of small personal posts. Many of them, there were larger versions. The, um, the survivor, the breast cancer nude in the lower and the middle um, part there, there's a larger version of that that is right now at Montclair State College or Montclair State University in their um, George Siegel Gallery that was part of an exhibition which was a retrospective of Klaus Schnitzer, who was my photography professor. Um, it, he was retiring after 49 years, and they put a call out to some of his former students to contribute work that showed the direction you had gone with what you learned from him. It was fabulous. I attended the opening, and then I went off to teach in March in Oregon, and when I came back, the entire world shut down, including the gallery. That piece is still in the gallery, and I'm hoping in sometime in the fall when somebody goes in there, we can have access to that work. Um, anyway, in 2008, I was asked by the Handweavers Guild of America uh, to be part of something they called the Design Challenge. They were going to pair me with someone from the sewing industry, and we were to come up with a fashion show ensemble. And it was such a great opportunity to work with someone 
in a collaboration, someone who had a completely different design sensibility than I did. And we came up with this combination, the two pieces on the left, the, the tencel dress, the hand-woven tencel dress. And they gave us yarn that were dyed in Floridian colors. And uh, my co-person and I, you know, we came up with the design of the garment. We came up with, she, we worked together on this. She lived in Texas. I lived in New Jersey. And the piece toured around for a couple of years uh, before we got it back. Um, I let her take the coat and I kept the dress. I didn't really have a need for a now two, three-year-old tencel dress um, that was made as part of a collaboration. But um, because cloth is cloth, and you can always take the scissors to it, I cut it apart and it made the jacket in the lower right-hand corner. That was really important to me because I have sitting on a lot of older work. And, it, and in the hand-weaving community, when, and in actually many of the arts community, they, when you do an exhibition, when you submit work to an exhibition, it needs to be current work. So any work that's older than two years is really useless to me, except as teaching tools, which, which is partly why I do half of what I do. But that said, this dress was in my closet, so I carefully took every single stitch apart, pressed out all the panels, and then made it into the jacket you see below. Um, so in 2005, I was also doing a conference in New England. It was called the New England Weaver Seminar. And uh, one of the, I'm still writing the color forecast column for Handwoven Magazine. And one of the people who was on my, in my stable of weavers came up to me at the conference and she said, you know, Daryl, half, half of the suppliers in this country are using your forecast palettes. So like Pro Chemical uses, makes little kits to go with your forecast column. Um, there are places that make uh, kits together of the, of the yarns that, that work with, you know, your palettes. And she said, you don't know anything about dyeing yarn and you really need to. So I'm going to propose after the conference that you come to my studio in uh, New Hampshire and spend a couple days and I'll teach you how to dye yarn. And I thought, Okay, so off I went. I had a bunch of white yarn and she taught me how to hand paint warps. She taught me about fiber reactive dyes and acid dyes and, and I learned just enough to get by with the seat of my pants. I mean, I'm good with color so I can look and tell whether to shift a color warmer or cooler. I can pretty much make any color I want, but largely I love the serendipitous, serendipitousness of being able to just throw yarn in a dye pot and pour some dye in and see what happens. Happens. So I was able to begin painting warps. This is as early as 2005. And I love this because, and, and I'll just explain this about my process. Each of the processes involved that ultimately make a garment stand individually. So I would dye yarn because it was fun to dye yarn. I would paint warps because it was fun to paint warps. And then I would have them hanging as a raw material to draw on later for creative inspiration. When I wove yardage, I had nothing in mind for it ever. I do not weave with an end goal in mind. I take yarn, I make yardage. I have no idea what it's going to turn into, but then it goes back on the shelf as a raw material. I think it's one of the few crafts where you can actually do individual components that stand alone. Um, so the dress on the right, um, I made the frosted florals dress. I did this for a fashion show, a handwoven fashion show at a conference. Um, it won a number of awards and exhibits and it hung in the back of my closet because, you know, really, I mean, I work in pajamas all day long in my studio. Where would I ever have a chance to wear this except at conferences and everyone has seen it. So that said, um, the, the uh, last year, I, I horrified everyone, especially my blog subscribers. I've been writing a blog now for about 10 years. Um, I horrified everyone when I said I was going to cut it up. Oh, people begged me. And I was like, no. It, to me, it's useless. It's cloth. And so I kept the top part, which was pretty cool. And I actually wore that to a couple of weddings last summer. And then the uh, piece on the, the lower right, the bias top, I cut the bottom of the dress up and made this bias top out of it. And I love this bias top. I wear it all the time. So I took something that I wasn't wearing that was recorded and award-winning, and I made it into something useful for me. 
So let me move quickly now. Um, I've got about 15 minutes left and um, I continue to dye warps and create palettes based on images. And um, at some point I had a um, an experience with a gallery because I'm sure there are people that are asking, you know, do I sell my work? Absolutely not. Actually, I don't. And this is sort of important. And I said I would never do that when I gave up craft fairs because this way I, I can do as much as I want. I can put as much effort as I want. I can do as much handwork as I want. And I don't have to worry about what it costs. I make one of a kind and I make it to fit me. And I have this wardrobe that is absolutely exploding, but it's okay because you know, I have fun doing this. For me, it's all about process. So this gallery asked me to make scarves for them. That was the Santa Fe Weaving Gallery. And I made a lot of scarves for them. And at some point, their, um, um, their clientele all had them. And so the relationship ended. And I still was sitting on some scarves. So because everything in my life turns into clothing, I took some of those scarves and put them together and made more clothing. Um, so when I actually do, say, a 10-yard run of fabric, um, it's great if it's hand-painted because there's colors all moving throughout it. There will be leftover. And what I love is that I can take that and make another piece out of the leftover. And if there's still scrap from that, I can put it together and make tote bags. And if there's still scrap from that, I can put the pieces together and do all kinds of things. And, and so for me, it's all just raw material, no matter how small the piece. I get to keep reusing and reinventing. Um, I used, uh, one day I decided to clear my, the mohair off my shelf and I just lined it all up and I wove this fabric to do this mohair coat on the left. And, um, and then in the middle is actually a hand felted piece. And I threw that in because I had to make a garment that was hand felted because I teach a lot. And a lot of my students or some of my students are felters and they needed to know how their cloth differed in hand woven cloth and how it was put together. So I had to make felted cloth. I, I will tell you, I'm not a felter. I don't want to be a felter. I hate felting, but I did it because I did it for my students. And I love the piece. I mean, I wear it a lot in the winter. Um, and then I took the leftover scrap from that um, that I didn't use in the felting of the uh, of the actual garment, um, and I spun this uh, picture. You see the picture. I did this hand spun, which I then knit into the striped sweater. So every bit gets used. I have. Um, um, a lot of yardage. Again, I weave um, the piece on the upper left. All that yarn is hand dyed. Um, I dyed skeins. It's all raw silk. And then I put it together in a twill combination. The piece on the right is, uh, again, a hand painted warp. Um, and you can see the color moving throughout it. And the piece on the lower left is, um, it was just an experiment I did. I have a, when you knit, and, and actually, even when you weave, there's small bits left that you can't bear to part with, but it takes up space. So I decided to weave yardage, and there were about 40 leftover balls of yarn that all made this up. It was quite a, a calculating feat, but I loved it. And these are some of the pieces that came out of those, out of that yardage. So that's the tartan is the second one in that that hand painted silk became the silk twill tunic and the piece on the right is a, a swing coat. Now at this point I te I'm teaching heavily and I've developed a lot of my own patterns for students to use. And a lot of people end up wanting to buy my patterns, but there was no vehicle to make that happen at that point. So um, in 2006, um, you know, the worst thing you could go through is watching your spouse diagnosed with cancer and not make it. Um, you know, I lived, he did not. He was diagnosed in the fall of 2015 with an inoperable esophageal cancer. And that entire year was probably the hardest of my life. My two children happened to be home. You know, my son had just come back from a deployment with the military. And it, we as a family were together. And we went through this together as a family. But um, the challenge of watching someone that you spent your entire life with um, dwindling down to nothing, his life becoming just dust, um, was pretty painful. And um, the only way I could get through that was to keep myself busy. And I remember the week that he came home with hospice, the, the last week of his life, 
at one point I had people sitting with him and I went up into my studio and I pulled a bunch of yarn off the shelves this is yarn that I call um, dye mops. When you have a bunch of dye left over from a project, you don't want to waste it or pour it down the drain. So you just sort of take white yarn and yes, stick it in the various pots and you make these sort of, you know, variegated skeins. And so I, I took those and I sat down with um, fiber so uh, weaving software and I created the hardest thing I've ever done is to try to make this yarn work into yardage. I had only so much. I had to calculate to the yard what I had. I had to calculate what would work, add what I needed to. And I look at this piece, which I call chaos, because it was probably the most chaotic week of my life. And I see what came out of it. And I needed this. I needed more than anything. You know, um, I wish that what happens in my life wasn't fuel for my work, but it is because the two are parallel. What happens and what I do with it. It's not what happens to you, it's what you do with it that is really important to the story, or at least to mine. Um, I, I did this piece, um, this is 2018, so this was about two years ago, and it was slated to go into a couple of exhibitions, but of course, you know, all, those are all um, done, I mean, canceled. Everything, just to let you know, this year, all of my teaching, all of the exhibition, the conferences, everything um, is, uh, actually, I was supposed to be the guest, uh, the guest artist invited to the Convergence Fashion Show this summer, which was in Knoxville, Tennessee. So I was supposed to send them five pieces, and this would have been one of them. But anyway, you can see that the, it started with the coat, and then the leftovers became the tunic on the left, and then more leftovers became the tote bag. There were five tote bags that I made that I sold at my guild sale. In the meantime, briefly, I also played around with um, with some artwork that wasn't clothing. Um, there are things happening in the world that I kind of wanted to address, but as an artist, you know, you look at everything. There's always multiple ways to look at everything, and I don't ever want to take sides because everybody has a point. And and even though we're polar opposites, somewhere in the middle there is truth. And so I try to sit in the middle and I look at life differently than everybody else because I am an artist, because that's how I was trained. And so I did a couple of these pieces. You know, I did a chromosome series based on gender and gender identity. Um, I have a family member that is part of the LGBT community and, um, and it is very near and dear to my heart. Um, the wall is something that we talk about a lot, and um, I built this piece of this wall, this an impenetrable wall that, um, that helped to solve some issues for me. Um, I did a piece on climate change, and one of my favorite pieces that hung in a number of exhibits, both digital, both virtual and uh, in, real, in reality last year, was um, this piece I call on the lower left of your screen called Eviscerate colon verb, deprive of vital or essential content. And um, it, it was a piece that I did that meant a lot to me when I made it. So right now I have, to wind this down, I have um, some yardage that I created um, in the past uh, year or two. Uh, and nothing sits long in my studio. I made the dress on the left out of that upper left-hand yardage um, called Driftwood. So let me just sidebar here. Um, last year, my daughter was the fiber assistant at Peters Valley. She um, had left the science field um, for reasons which are not important to this story, but she left the science field in the veterinary field and went to Peters Valley to kind of pursue her own brand as an artist. And because I was supported along the way, I thought the need to do that for her. And so when she got back from Peters Valley and her stint there last fall, after having at the very end an emergency appendectomy <laughs> while she was still under Peters Valley's care, um, I brought her home and I hired her. And one of the reasons I hired her is because she is a millennial, as she says, and knows her way around the computer. And so she has undertaken a task for me that I never thought that I would ever be able to do. But when the world stopped in March and all of my work was canceled, I made her go online and take a course in uh, Adobe Illustrator. 
And she is now um, turning all of my patterns, the dozen patterns I use for classes into vector drawings and packaging them for sale as digital downloads. And so I threw these pictures in because they are based on the patterns that I sell. You can find them in my shop. That was a shameless commercial announcement. And Threads Magazine actually had me come up to their studios in um, Newtown, Connecticut and shoot a whole series of videos uh, which are available through their insider uh, subscription series and I was also episode 13 of their podcast sewing with threads and of course I still write for their magazine the current issue I think I answered a Q&A for them um, in the late winter this year one of the first projects my daughter and I embarked on because when she moved back home not only did she bring her animals but she brought all of her looms and her studio. Between us, we own 34 shaft looms. And th that's a lot, especially when you could see the size of some of them directly behind me. We had looms in every room of the house. It was untenable. And I woke up really early, late, late fall, uh, growing into the winter, and my, this voice in my head, which I swear is my late husband, said to me, just renovate the garage. So I called my handyman, we talked about it, and he dove in and within three months, I have this amazing studio. So the basement where my daughter was living became my sewing room. And so I have some pictures here of my basement sewing room and the garage became um, my, my uh, studio. I'm sitting out here. We have looms, uh, the bookcases that you see on the lower right. Um, it actually protects the yarn alley. If you go behind the bookcases, there's this whole wall of yarn. And it is a beautiful creative space that feeds my soul. All my fiber supplies are here. I never have to leave it. And guess what? I can't leave it because the world shut down. And I, I'm embarrassed to say this, but I, I know I've talked to other people in my position who have said, you know, to be given the gift of time when you are a craftsman on the road, earning your living by teaching and lecturing, the gift of time is absolutely priceless. And if it takes me having no work this year to actually move in a different direction and explore and create, I am, um, I'm incredibly grateful for that. So I end with this slide because I feel like we've come full circle. Um, in February of this year, Peters Valley took a booth at the ACC Craft Fair in Baltimore, where I was back in 1986. And they, um, as part of an emerging artists kind of a thing, they had, uh, people that, who were assistants for them and they were invited to participate and show their work and give them a sense of what this lifestyle is like. And when my daughter suggested that she do this, I looked at her with horror and said, no, you don't want to do that. And she said, but I want to try mom. And I was like, okay. So this is ACC Baltimore, Peters Valley's booth. I am so grateful to them, not only giving me opportunities to exhibit, to teach, to be on their board of directors, but they've also given the door opening to my daughter. You know, I feel like it's now into a second generation. And so her dragon shawls uh, that she did on a knitting machine that she learned to do in a class she took at helped out at, at Peters Valley. Um, if you look in the upper left-hand corner, she's the one in blue in the middle of the photo in that blue dragon shawl. But you can see um, the work she did on the knitting machine. And um, I think they're up on her Etsy site. But I, I end with this because I feel like Peters Valley has been a link through all of this. I did the craft fairs there. I did exhibits there. I've taught there since the mid-80s. And I am grateful for that ongoing support and to now that support for my daughter. So with that, um, Kristen, I'll turn it back over to you. I think we're at time. I think we are. Thank you so much, Daryl. That's just fantastic. What a great story. Um, you know, Peters Valley is just an amazing place and I love that you're a part of it and that we could have a legacy with Brianna and it's been fun to watch her mm -hmm. emerge also and we're all about that journey right that's really what we're all about so thank you Daryl um, and for for now this concludes our virtual 
artist lecture. And for anyone who would like to tune in next time, we have uh, Timothy Jacobson, who is a photographer, a really wonderful guy, journalist, media, storyteller, um, teacher for Peters Valley and also at Hood College. And he is going to be on uh, July 15th. So register, please. It'll be fun. And thank you, Daryl. Thank you, everyone, for tuning in from all over the country and all over the world. Just fantastic. We love it. Have a wonderful night. Thank you. Bye-bye.